Hello. Now, it's not just because I'm preaching that I'm going to say this, but God's already moving tonight, and the Holy Spirit is already so evident because not only did Carly mention the verse that I'm bringing tonight, but also even in the prayer, Christiane picked a song that exactly says what Carly just says and what this word that I'm about to bring says as well about Christ being our firm foundation. And the song that Christiane played um, during prayer, it was just the piano instrumental, but I immediately remember the lyrics and it says, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I'll never be more glad that I put my faith in Jesus because he never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why should he fail now? He won't. So God's already in it because the title of my message tonight is The Wise Builder. And the passage that I'm bringing is about the wise builder who built their house on the rock and the foolish builder who built their house on sand. So we already know the Holy Spirit is moving and speaking. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. And it says this, everyone who hears these words of mine, and this is Jesus speaking, and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish person who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for this night. We thank you, God, that you're already speaking. And we thank you, God, for your promises and that your word never returns void. So tonight, God, let us have open hearts and open hear, ears to hear all that you're speaking tonight. We love you. We praise you. And we just pray that this message brings you glory and that we can learn something new about you tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we see here that Jesus is a brilliant teacher. Jesus is smart. You know, and when he's teaching the people this story, he teaches it using a parable, using a story within a story, if you will. So you hear this story once, and it's really hard to forget it because the, the visuals it gives you is so instant. You know, you see a house on rock, you see a house on sand, one falls, one does not. It's hard to forget that, that visual, at least it was for me. It's so simple that a child can understand it. And when I first heard this word, or the first time I remember hearing this word, I was a little kid, I was like in the fourth grade, and my parents were looking for a church. We already had a Brazilian church we went to at night, but that wasn't enough for them. They wanted something in the morning too in English for me. And one of my core memories as a kid was walking into a church, and we were looking around at that time. It was before we came to this church. And that just goes to show how important kids ministry is because it, it, it impacted me to this day. So I walk in to church and like, it was great. They have the high beat um, worship music and a fun word. And they brought this passage in, in Matthew. And then they all took us to a room in the back and there was this kiddie pool. And they got all the kids all around it looking at this kiddie pool. On one side was a bunch of bricks. On the other was literally sand. I hope to God they didn't go during like the summer during hurricane season because they would have gotten a, such a big fine to bring that much sand in because that's illegal in Florida. But nevertheless, here we are, big kiddie pool, bricks, sand, a little tiny plastic house on each end. And you can kind of see where this is going. They explain the parable again. They explain the story. But this time, as they were explaining about the wise builder and his house built on the foundation of rock, they poured like a pitcher, like a lot of water, and you got to see that the house didn't move, it didn't shake, it stayed put. And then, of course, when they put the pitcher of water over the sand, it all, like, fell apart so dramatically, like, the house was buried beneath everything. And as a kid, I was like, whoa, like, being able to see that so visually. And it stuck to me to this day. And what's great about parables and stories like this is that they're easy to remember, but they're not always easily understood. You can get the surface level of it, but there's always something deeper that's like so nice to get into and like really find out what exactly is Jesus saying. Because it's not meant to be taken literally, 
the literal part of it is really to help us remember the lesson. And a lot of times in these stories, the cultural context that it's in has to do a lot with how the story is understood. So looking back today and, and seeing like exactly how does this apply to the people who were listening to it at the time that Jesus was saying doesn't change the story for us, but makes it richer for us. For example, the main idea of this parable of the wise and the foolish builder is that when you hear the word of God, you do it, you apply it, right? The concept of hearing and doing. So in the Jewish faith, especially at that time, Faith required works. For you to be faithful, you had to put in the work. You know, you had to follow all the commandments, all the laws to a T. You had to do the sacrifice, the whole thing. Faith always involved action. So as the people of God are listening to Jesus tell this story, Jesus is teaching them. They always carry that in their hearts, that when you believe in God, there's an element of living out what you believed, so when Jesus said, everyone who hears my words and does them or hears my words and put them into practice, there's something that would have, they would have immediately recognized as a natural reaction to hearing the word of God is that when you have faith on something that is trustworthy and true, you act on it. It's not just about hearing it, it's putting it into practice or else it's not the same as believing. Like if you didn't act it out, you weren't a believer. So for there to be belief, there needs to be action. And this actually still applies to us today. We're responsible for practicing what we, what we know. And in James chapter 1, verse 22, it says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word and does not know what it says it's like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So he's, he's telling us that it's easy to see ourselves as being faithful because, oh, we've heard the word, we've understand it, we get it, well, whatever. But our faithfulness requires us to practice what we've learned, what we hear. Another thing about this parable is that where it's placed and like the time and place in which Jesus is telling the story is very interesting. And I think it's very important to note because in this passage in Matthew, this is at the very end of the longest and some would say most important sermon of Jesus's life that's been recorded. And that was the sermon on the mount. Now, right before it, in verses 21 and 23, Jesus says that not everyone who says, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who prophesies in Jesus' name or drove out demons in Jesus' name or performed miracles in Jesus' name will enter heaven. Jesus actually says, I never knew you. Away from me, very dramatic, but away from me, evildoers. But it's true, like, he, these, like he's describing these people who are doing all these things in Jesus' name, but they never really knew him. He said, away from me, I do not know you. And boom, right after he says that, that's the verse that we hear about the wise man and the foolish man building their houses. And I don't think that's a coincidence because your faith, it, it needs to be put in action. But the action is not busy work. It's not, a lot of times what we, what we see as ministry, ministry can look like that if our hearts aren't in the right place, if you don't truly know Jesus as the one whose words you're building your life upon. Besides that, they're just words that you hear, especially in ministry, because it can seem like you have a firm foundation because you're serving, you're in church every week, but it's not until the storms come that you start to notice the cracks in your foundation. I'll say that again. It's not until the storms come that you notice the cracks in your foundation. So how did the wise man build on a solid foundation? How did he go about to doing this? How did he act on his faith? 
Now, Matthew gives a really nice description. I love how Matthew describes it. It's like very poetic. You know, he says, the rain fell, the floods came, the wind blew, beat against the house, and great was the fall of it. Like it's very, you know, I like how he words it. But there's another instance where we see this passage. And that's found in Luke. Now, good old Dr. Luke, biblical scholars and historians often point out he was a Gentile and he was Greek educated. So he had a different perspective than Matthew did because the Jewish terrain at that time, it allowed for houses to be built easily with a rock base. But in Greece, Greeks were familiar that when they built a house and they want a strong foundation, you got to dig, dig, dig deep until you reach rock that's solid enough to build a foundation on. So I'd like us to turn to Luke chapter 6, and it's the same story but written from a different point of view. Starting in verse 46, it says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house and could not shake it because it had been built well. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who has built a house on a ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So immediately the first takeaway from this passage is in verse 47, which leads me to my next point. Jesus shows us what a good builder is like. We may not always know the state of our foundation because a lot of times, like I said before, storms reveal that to us. We may think everything's fine when there's something wrong, but God knows. We can ask God to show us. Like it says here, like Jesus says, I will show you what a, a, a building a house on a solid foundation looks like. And we can ask God to reveal it to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul writes, however, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for us who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. So we can ask God, we can ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what is the state of our foundation And it's crazy how this passage says, the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Because check out this next part back in Luke in verse 48. The wise builder, he dug down deep. Now this phrase, when you translate it from Greek, the word that's used to say dug deep literally means dig deep, right? It means deep or make deep. But the great thing about Greek is there's always another meaning. They have many different meanings for their words. And that third meaning is the deep things of God, things hidden and above man's scrutiny, especially divine counsels. So, and God can search us, even the deep things of God, God can search and reveal to us. Amen. And continuing in verse 48, the wise builder, um, He had to dig deep because in order to build a strong foundation, and this leads us to our next, my next point, is you must dig deep to have that strong foundation. In Psalm 42, verse 7, David, this whole psalm, David is very dramatic in his feelings, but there's a lot of great poetry. It's that one that talks about how he's thirsting for God like a deer after water. There's so much great imagery. Um, He's really downcast in this passage. And in verse 7, he says, Deep calls out to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and waves have gone over me. And essentially, what this is proving is that God is not surface level. He desires a deeper relationship with us. And we can't just patch up the surface, put a nice fresh coat of paint on it, and move on. No amount of paint or Gorilla Glue will fix a deep crack in the foundation nothing will fix that. Like God desires more. There's always more. There's always deeper. Now, one of my favorite shows ever is Love It or List It. Make some noise if you've seen it. 
or you watch it, you enjoy it like I do. I think it's one of Canada's great gifts to God's green earth is love it or list it. Um, and basically, if you haven't seen the show, it's like a home renovation show. And it always starts with a couple who just can't live in their house anymore. Either they outgrew it, it's too small, or there's too many repairs to be made. So the show comes in and they bring in two people. They bring in an interior decorator and a realtor. So the interior decorator, you give them a budget and say, this is how much money I can give you to try to fix my house. And then you give a budget to the realtor, be like, okay, now look for a house that you, we can leave and we'll buy that house instead. We'll sell our house and buy that house. And at the end of the episode, based on the houses that the realtor finds or the renovations that the interior decorator does, they decide to either love the home and stay in it or list it, sell it, you know, go to another house. And one of the biggest conflicts, and I live for the drama, that happens almost every single episode it's like you're, 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 you, I sit there and I'm gasping and I'm like, it's when there's something wrong with the house, when there's something foundationally wrong with the house to the point where they can't, they can't um, redecorate it anymore, they can't remodel it anymore, they have to pause everything, bring the couple back in. It's this huge, dramatic, like long pause where they're like, something's wrong with the house and then they explain what it is. Usually it has to do with the support beams or something with the foundation of the house that's truly wrong. And so then they have to make a decision to either fix that, use the money that they had in their budget to fix it, or cough up more money to fix that and everything else that they wanted to fix in the first place. And it's always something that they least expect that's hidden underneath, and only when they start tearing things down do they see that there's something wrong with it. And they can't continue building until that issue is fixed. And that's why the foundation of whatever you're building is so important. So the wise man dug down deep in the deep things of God that's usually hidden from man and laid down the foundation on the rock. Now Jesus, like I said, he's a smart man. He's very clever. Where's the best place to hide something? In plain sight. How about it? Because he's talking about like building on the rock. Well, what is the rock? Literally the person telling you the parable. Literally the person telling you the story. He is the rock. And as we see, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says... By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it, but each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, before I get to our next point, I just love Paul because he's so humble. He's, like, he's not a wise builder. He's an expert builder. With all his, he's an expert builder. And I like poking fun at Paul because he's so serious in his writings. But what he's saying is true. And that leads me to my next point, that Jesus is our solid rock. Before you build anything, the foundation needs to be Jesus. And in the next part of the parable, the storm comes. Because like Jesus said, in this world, we're going to have troubles. He's overcome the world, right? But there will be troubles in this world. There will be storms. Storms are coming if they haven't already. And like I mentioned previously, it's not until the storms come that until you notice the, the cracks in your foundation. And then I'm on staff here at church and I have, like this is my favorite part of my job. Well, one of them, I look forward to it every week is I get to sit in during the pastor's meetings. And every week they have a weekly pastor meeting every Tuesday morning. And my favorite part of it is the devotionals. And every week they get together before they even discuss anything that happened in the services, any planning, anything. They worship, they have someone bring a devotional, one of the staff, and they pray. And I look forward to it every week. I'm like that weirdo in the corner, like writing notes every time like someone's writing, saying something. Because it's so nice, because you, you hear preachings all the time, especially if you work in a church, like you hear, but when you get to hear something personal that they're bringing, like their devotion, it's it always speaks to me. And one week, Pastor Jen brought a devotion on this very topic. And she put it this way. There are cracks within us that we don't discover until the storm hits. We can be weathered by a storm, but if your foundation is solid, you won't be swept away. You can be weathered by a storm, but if your foundation is solid, you won't be swept away. 
One of my favorite songs at the moment is called Weathered by Bethel. And it's written by two of my favorite songwriters, Dante Bo and Hannah McClure. Like anything they write, I'm just sobbing every time. And when you first hear the song, I'll be honest with you, it's not like a traditional worship song. I don't think I'd ever put it in a set just because it's, very, it's a very personal song. But it hits me every time. The chorus says, how sweet it is to trust you, Jesus. To know you, I mean really know you. Father, Son, and Holy Shepherd, a love so deep it can't be measured. A love so real, a love that's weathered. Now we can be weathered by a storm, but if your foundation is solid, you won't be swept away. The last part of the builder's story is that the house did not fall because it was well built. And when first reading this parable, it seems obvious, like of course, you should want to build something on solid foundation. But I'm not an advocate for sand or anything, but I'm here to shed some light on why sand might be appealing. It does have a lot of appeal, believe it or not, because it's temporary, it's easier. You know, if you're already expecting that it's not going to be the most solid thing, not yet, Christiane. That's coming soon. <laughs> um, it has a lot of appeal because it's something that um, you're already going into it. You're like, this could be teared down easily. Mm, I'll just put it up again. It gets old after a while, but maybe something temporary attracts you because it's not as personal. You have to get too deep with it. You don't have to dig deep. Digging deep hurts. It hurts getting down to the nooks and crannies of every single part of your soul and making sure everything's okay and having God search you like that. It hurts. It's, it can get messy for a bit. So sometimes maybe it's just easier to like, you know what, let me just pack up, build it again. It's down, let me build it again. And where there's sand, another thing that can be appealing, and this is the way I think, is that usually where there's sand, there means that there's a view. Whether it be a desert or a beach, it's a view. I'm a sucker for a view. I'm a big sucker for a view. I, the only reason we live in our apartment that we live in now is, and my husband can attest to this, is there is a lake in the backyard, okay? And I use the excuse, like, I'm an artist. I need to be inspired. I need to look at nature. My husband was taking care of all the other details, like making sure that it's in a good location, that it's safe, all the amenities, things like that. No, I just care that there was a view. I don't care where we lived, but as long as there was a view, I was there. That's all I wanted. That was literally, my, we would look at houses. I'm like, is there a view? I'm out. <laughs> and so a lot of times where there's sand, there's a view. And how many of you know that when you accept Jesus into your heart, you don't view things the same way anymore. You don't see things the same. You're not looking at things from the same place. And I've spoken about this before, but even in my own life, I noticed a stark difference from before my parents were born again and accepted Christ into their lives and after. Like, I was eight years old, but I knew immediately that we're a different family now that that's happened. They didn't enjoy the same things anymore. And because you're in a different place. You're viewing the world from a different place. But still, worldly things can be appealing, right? The view is really nice. I'm not talking about the super obvious thing where, you know, like growing up, there's like the very Christianese view of the world is just sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and we are in the world, but not of it, that sort of thing. It can be the subtle things too, like how you speak to one another. Um, the word gossip has a harsh and legalistic tone because you're like, I don't gossip, but how are you talking about other people when they're not around? Or even just listening you know, a lot of times you want to fit in. I've been victim of this, where depending on the environment I'm in and they're like poking fun at someone or something in a way that like, ah, should I be participating in this conversation? But I don't want it to be awkward. I'm going to just, huh, just chuckle it out. That also, you know, or wanting to fit in. Or even not just how you treat others, but how are you treating yourself? Like, how are you viewing yourself with all the messages in the media that we see in social media on TikTok? Don't get me started on TikTok. There's always a new way to live your life on TikTok. There's always this new spiritual life hack or something. Are we pressured to be more like what we see around us? 
just because the view is nicer. You know, it's more exciting for sure. And another thing about sand, sand leaves a lot of evidence. Like when you're walking on a beach, you can look back and see footprints, right? And you can see what's been there. You can see that you've been walking there. And a lot of times as Christians, it's like we rely on God to keep showing us that he's there, that he's moving, that he's working before we can truly believe it. Like constantly wanting to prove that God is there instead of trusting in that solid rock. You stand on unsteady ground waiting for God to just keep showing himself. Or waiting for the right person to pray for you. I mean, it's, I've done this many times where like something happens. I'm like, I go to that one friend that I know will pray for me, but then I'm not praying for myself. I'm not seeking God for myself. I'm not forming and working on my own relationship with God for myself. And there's a story that you hear a lot in church of someone walking on the beach and they look back and they only see one set of footprints. And they look to Jesus and they're like, Lord, you said you'd always be there with me, but I only see one set of footprints. What's up with that? <laughs> and Jesus replies, that's because I've been carrying you all along. And the music swells, cue the tears, cue the chills, the happy ending, all that stuff. But with sand, sometimes it can seem like solid and enough ground, even if the conditions are right. This video you see behind me, I took from when I was in Brazil back in December. I had the, oh my God, the best time. I visited my husband's family in Brazil, and he is from the most beautiful town. I have some pictures. Um, it's literally the most beautiful place, surrounded by beach, surrounded by sand, surrounded by water. It's absolutely, I'm living my best life, as you can tell. <laughs> it was great. Now, back to the video. One particular day, I got up really early because all I wanted to do was go to the beach. Like I said, I'm a sucker for a view. That's all I wanted to do. I would bother Vinny so much. Like, are we going to the beach? Are we going to, we going to the beach today? Even if it was raining, windy, I don't care. I wanted to go to the beach. <laughs> and one particular day, I went with Vinny's mom. It was early in the morning. And she was heading to the gym that's right on the shore. I'm like, I'm there. Not at the gym, but I'll be at the beach. And I tagged along so I could just walk. And as I'm walking... I'm alone with my thoughts and I begin to pray and what comes to my mind is that story that we hear, you know, about the person walking on the beach and only one set of footprints. And as I look down, I notice I'm not leaving any footprints on this sand. I'm walking backwards in here so you guys can see. I'm not leaving any footprints at all. And, what, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, is that you? <laughs> no, but for real, what's crazy about this beach in Ibituba, the sand is different from the sands here. It's not like the nice, soft, white sand. What's crazy is that um, it's hard. It's almost like rock when you're walking on it. To sunbathe, it hurts. Like if you're laying on a towel, you need to lay like three towels. It hurts. And at the same time, you can walk for miles and just not get tired because your feet aren't digging in. It literally, it, it leaves barely any footprint at all. And a lot of times in life, if you're, you know, relying on building on the, on the things that aren't as solid, things that don't last, you're not going to get very far because sometimes the storms can wipe away everything and leaves no footprints to be seen. Or even like here, I'm walking on sand and I don't see many footprints either. The only thing that will last is your foundation in Jesus, is your solid rock. Not because of what he can do, how he can make you feel, but because he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. In him alone, like Carly said, he's our cornerstone. In him alone do we live and move and have our being. Not circumstances, not the things of this world. And where this has been more than real to me has been in my pregnancy. I'm 18 weeks. Doesn't look like much. Thank you, Christian. It doesn't look like much. It's just a little over four months. And what no one tells you about pregnancy is that so much happens in your first and second trimester. Your body changes so much, but you don't really show it until you're mm, midway or even after you're halfway through. Like you guys probably can tell because you know me, but anyone else who doesn't know me be like, gosh, she just had a burrito for lunch, you know? I'm almost midway now and like mm, this, this, I could hide this. You know, but already so much is happening. Like this week alone, like little baby, their fingerprints are forming, their ears are hearing, they're hearing their mom right now. They can hear outside noise, outside noises now. 
And just four months ago, this baby was this tiny little cell. And now it's the size of, according to my app, an artichoke. <laughs> and in the beginning of my pregnancy, my husband can attest to this, I was nervous. And I, would, I still catch myself being nervous and I have to truly battle my anxiety with scripture. In the beginning, I was living from ultrasound to ultrasound. My peace only lasted as long as the doctor's visit. Because as soon as I was out, I was like, okay, when's the next ultrasound? When can we see the baby again? When can we make sure it's growing and it's, it's growing right? But I, the Holy Spirit had to check me. And I began feeling God ask me, do you trust me? Every time I began to work, do you trust me? I noticed a crack in my foundation at that point because this is actually my second pregnancy and Vinny and I miscarried back in December, but God was faithful. You know, I had the support of my husband, of my family, of my church. And although we felt peace of God's plans, you know, that God's plans are greater than our own, no matter how good it, our own plans are, his plans are always better and we have to trust in that. But that storm revealed the crack in my foundation when it came to trust. And so in February, when we found out that I was pregnant again, I had to go back to that foundation and literally see what Jesus teaches, see what his word teaches about holding my thoughts captive. Like it says in the word, that for every anxious thought in my mind, I had to declare scripture and I still am to this day to remind myself not to lean on my own understanding, to trust in God with all my heart, to remind myself that God is the rewarder of those who seek him, that all things are possible for those who believe, that the testing of my faith will produce perseverance, and that for those who love God, all things work together for good. I couldn't let myself succumb to worry, fear, anxiety, doubt, because that's not what I built my life on. So when you're building your life on the rock, that is Jesus and God is moving and working in your life. A lot of times you don't, you can't see it. It's like being pregnant. All of you are pregnant in here with the dreams of God. <laughs> like look at King David or Joseph or even Jesus. When King David was anointed king as a boy, he only finally became king when he was in his thirties. Joseph was sold into slavery by his own family and faced many trials before, as an adult, he had a seat of power in Egypt and was able to help his family through a famine. And even Jesus, the son of God, he started his ministry in his 30s. There was so much that happened that we didn't see, but a foundation was being built. We can't rely on what we see to build on our foundation. We can't build a foundation on our works, even if they're for God especially if they're for God. Because like Jesus says, you can call him Lord, but it means nothing if he doesn't know you. He means nothing if you don't know him. When Jesus says, who hears these words of mine and does them, he doesn't mean those who hear my words and go to church. <laughs> those who hear my words and grab a mic and preach, no offense to myself, but the words he's talking about is the living word. It's practicing what you preach. It's being a peacemaker. It's treating others how you wanna be treated. It's holding your thoughts captive. It's loving your enemies. It's forgiveness. It's seeking first God's kingdom. It's spending time with Jesus, knowing the word, which will then continuously transform your heart and renew your mind. And as we look back, what happened to that foolish man who built his house on sand? The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. But the wise man, the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock, the solid rock. So my question for you tonight is, what is your foundation today? Or rather, what is the state of your foundation today? And that's something that truly only you and God can answer. And for this altar call, I just love us to take a moment of reflection. Going back to our first point, Jesus can show us the nature of how we're building our foundation, the state of our foundation. In Psalm 139, it says, David is, is, is telling God, search me, God know my heart, test me, and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. 
God can search us and reveal to us. So above all else, that's my prayer tonight. As we go into this moment of prayer, I don't want it to be based on emotion or based on someone else praying for us, but really us seeking God for ourselves. If every head could be bowed and eye closed, we're gonna have like a moment of worship um, and the altar is open if you wanna come up. But truly, these next couple moments, Let's just ask God to search our hearts and reveal the state of our foundation and ask him to reveal to us. And if this needs to be a moment of redeclaration, because a lot of times for me, I need to say it. I need to declare scripture. I need to literally tell God. If that needs to be a moment for you tonight, let it be that moment. Or if you just need to sit in silence and let God speak to you, if we could stand. I just wanna take this next moment. We're gonna keep quiet and just really allow God to just do, to just, just surrender ourselves to God in this moment. If you wanna come up to the altar, you can come up. Lord, we surrender ourselves before you tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you are sovereign. You are our solid rock. Show us what it truly means to build our life upon that rock, Jesus. In this moment right now, God, we open up our hearts open up our minds, open the eyes of our hearts, God, and reveal to us in all the ways that you can be our foundation if you're not already. We surrender this moment to you, Jesus. Speak to us. We love you, Lord. Amen. We cannot close this night off without giving each one of us an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. So right now, with every head bowed down, if you have not yet accepted Jesus' sacrifice that he made on the cross for our sins, or if you feel like you need to rededicate your life to Jesus, then right now what I'm gonna ask you to do is just lift up your hands. Every head is bowed down. This is just a moment between you and God, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hands are being lifted all around here. Praise your name, Jesus. And right now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna invite everybody to pray this prayer out loud. And for those of you whose hands are lifted up, right now what you are saying is, Jesus, I'm accepting you. And from this moment forward, I'm gonna do my best to live my life for you, to build my life on the firm foundation. So let's all pray this prayer together. Jesus, Thank you for the sacrifice that you made on the cross for my sins. I can never repay you, but what I can do from this moment forward is surrender my life and live every day for your glory. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. If you made that prayer, I want to encourage you to connect with one of our leaders tonight. Do not leave this place without a Bible. Spend time in your word. Find a church that preaches and speaks Jesus because it really is all about him now let's give a round of applause to Natasha for the word that she brought praise God it was powerful it was anointed and right before we close out I do want to say that Pastor Jermil is not here tonight because he is out of town for work but he is so sad to not be here but he sends all his love and I can't wait to tell him how awesome it was. So before we are dismissed, let's go ahead and let's read this verse together. And it says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you guys for coming. God bless. We'll see you guys next week. Fellowship. There's coffee in the back. Say hi to a few people before you guys head out.